Hello, my name is David Bryan, and this is Curiosity Invited, a podcast inspired by endless curiosity. Tune in for an open-minded conversation about interesting and important things. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Curiosity Invited. My name is David Bryan, and today I have the great pleasure of speaking with somebody I've known for, wow, how many years? 14. Since you were 14. And I'm not going to ask you how old you are, but you might tell me, but uh, you got to be close to 40. Oh, 41. Wow. Yep. Wow. We know each other a long time. Yes, indeed. How come you look the same and I don't? (laughs) I don't know how that works. Uh, I like to think I'm older, though. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. That's wild. So Sophia was, I met Sophia when um, she applied to the school that I was at the time trying to get off the ground and, um, and did. And, uh, and, and we've known each other. We've stayed in touch. We've known each other for years. Uh, ultimately, Sophia graduated from Berkeley, came to work at the school, and has been there for well, how many years? 17 years now. 17 years. Wow. And um, and is both a teacher. Uh, I know for a while you were a curriculum coordinator or head of curriculum or something for the Spanish Yeah, department. now I'm department. department chair. Now you're department chair as of recent, like re- recently. As of this year. As of this year. Uh, That's great. As of, well, technically I start next year. Ah, you mean the, the year coming. Got it. Yes. Got it. Well, so we're going to have a really frank conversation because that's the only conversation. Those are the only conversations I've ever had with Sophia. <laughs> and, um, and you know, I, I'll say to the audience, but I'll really, I'm saying to you, Sophia, it's, it's, I learned more. Well, you were the first person to actually open my eyes to to the entire, uh, opened my eyes to how much I didn't understand about disability and ability and um, and the assumptions that people make, that I was making, that I make, based on, really based on uh, sort of colloquial cultural misunderstanding and not... Uh, you know, at any rate, you know, so we're going to have a frank conversation. And um, and if I ask you questions you don't want to answer, or if you go to a territory and I don't want, I'm going to say, don't talk about that. Um, but, <laughs> okay. but, but that's probably not going to happen, knowing you. Um, <laughs> so, so, so thank you for coming on to Curiosity Invited, and thanks for doing this, and thanks for being willing to have a conversation about you know look what what's so um what i have mixed feelings about is so i know you to be an incredibly competent human being and i'm going to give a little bit of your bio i'll put it in the in the in the description but i'll give a little bit of your bio so that other people can get a sense but um you know um here we are a bunch we could talk about all sorts of things you okay. you have you have points of view you have knowledge you have expertise in all sorts of things and here we are again talk, you know people want to people meaning me want to talk to you and want you to be willing to talk about ability disability etc so um so there's that's ironic because you're way more than that and mm-hmm. And yet, somehow, you are also that, and well, I'm okay with, that. Yeah. Uh, and I and I know that is what I what I've centered in on in a lot of my educational. Even though I've been an educator for what more than twenty years now, um, because I started my educational journey in in college. Um, as a teacher, I, going into it, knew 
that regardless of what subject I was teaching, the disability was going to be part of of the teaching moments because regardless of, of whether I'm teaching teacher preparation in college or Spanish, the disability is never away mm -hmm. from my frame of reference and from my students' frame of reference. Like regardless of who I'm teaching, the fact that I am not your traditional teacher because I can't be a traditional teacher. I can't be the teacher who, who, or the professor who writes things on the board and just has them copy things that I write because my writing sucks. Because I, because I can't reach the board because I can't. So I, in any context, the disability is going to take full focus. And, and because of that, I've, been okay with always talking about how my disability affects my life Got because it. it does yeah yeah i remember one time you know there was a and maybe it's still there um but there was a, a period where um people were Normally able, I don't even know what, how to use the words, right? Re regular folks, people without an <laughs> obvious disability, yeah. um, were using language like differently abled. And oh, God. I remember one time you, you just said, <laughs> you said to me, it was like, I don't know what they're talking about. I'm disabled. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, we're differently able. That's true. But like, this is moving through the world the way I move through the world is a disability. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, I still cringe when people use words like "incapable" and like I get what they're trying to do. They're trying to normalize it. They're trying to be what, and I still agree with this person first language, like person with a disability and things like that, because it shouldn't be the first thing somebody thinks about when they see me, but I also acknowledge that it is such a central focus of who mm -hmm. I am that not acknowledging that is also a disservice. Mm -hmm. um, um, so when when people try to normalize it in a way where it kind of detracts from it also drives me crazy right. because it it is important to, and that's me and my personal preference, that somebody else might say to you, I love when people uh, don't use the word disabled and, and, and maybe uses a more, a more um, positive, if you will, frame of reference, because for them, that's what makes them comfortable. So it's all here is where I always tell people when I'm doing trainings about disability awareness and disability and inclusive practice. I said, I I always say you have to take your cue from the person that you're talking to. You can't assume that somebody is going to like the term uh disabled person or person with a disability it's really up to them well i i get that and you know we're living at a time where where so many things are so highly politicized and so you may be comfortable with it but but i well, i guarantee you that there will be people leaving comments that that you know try to rake me over the coals because I, you know, because I referred to you as someone with a disability as because be, even though you're fine with it and you, and in fact, you just said you prefer the acknowledgement of that. Um, and yet there's an intolerance that is oh, linguistic, sure. right? Right. I mean, that, that is, 
you use the wrong word. So we live at a really weird time. And, and that's why I, my advice to anyone when they're dealing with sensitive language is really, it depends on the person you're talking to. So not being afraid to acknowledge like, hey, so how would you like me to refer to you in context? Right. Like, and acknowledging that there is that language that you're willing to to talk to the person in the way that they are comfortable um, yeah. Yeah. is the best way to do it. Um, um, well, so so lest you lest anyone listening to this think that Sophia is only about that. Uh, let me just let me just tell you. So so after after high school, which she graduated from, <laughs> she went off yeah. to Ber she went off to Berkeley. Got a degree in political science with minors in Spanish and disability studies. She went on to learn, earn a master's degree in secondary education and a doctoral degree in educational leadership for social justice, both from Loyola Marymount University. So, so you're speaking to somebody, or I'm speaking to somebody, or you're yeah. listening to somebody with uh, with substantial background and experience uh, in the world of education. Um, and, and, you know, in the, in the practice of teaching. So she is not just a theoretician, nothing wrong with that, by the way. Um, but, but it actually has years and years of experience in the classroom and even more years of experience of the of experience in a wheelchair. So what would you, would you be comfortable talking about? Well, like, what, like, why sure. are you in a wheelchair? What's your... What's your, what's my deal? What's the um, deal? <laughs> um, I was born. Uh, to, I was supposed to be born on Christmas Day, and I was born on October eighth. So I was born a few months premature. Um, and when I was born, um, I was only three pounds. Um, and so. I, because of the lack of oxygen during my birth, uh, I was at six months old or so, can't remember the exact time I should, uh, uh, diagnosed with cerebral palsy, um, because my, my parents started to notice that I was not developing my fine motor skills and and things like that um so they uh went to various doctors and mm -hmm. eventually i was diagnosed with cerebral palsy my father and and my mother my father being a a um professor was very determined from the from the a very young age that my education and my mind was going to be what was going to be my way of proving to folks that I was that I was not someone to be pitied. Um, so I thank both of my parents every single day for that mm. drive um, because that is really what uh, what has got me to the point of where I am today and why I value education from the very outset. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was lucky enough to be able to do that because I was, my cerebral palsy did not affect my, in that way. So I was able to, to pursue education and I, and I'm, lucky in that in that mm -hmm. context mm -hmm. for sure um and i know i know you went off to berkeley after high school well wait how do, i don't know if it makes any sense for you you're, you know but but i remember that there was th that you were at a public school before somewhere in san fernando valley and um and it was not a pleasant experience it and, was definitely not a pleasant it, experience it was almost like you were you were too much trouble. The school that I 
uh, was in for high school was really just not physically accessible. Uh, so, uh, the straw that broke the camel's back, for lack of a better phrase, was uh, I was physically injured yes. at the school. And I, and I, um, from that moment forward, was not ever going to step foot in the school again. Right. And that is how we ended up in yeah. your school at the time. Um, yeah. I mean, you, when you when I, you said you were physically injured, it wasn't it wasn't a hostile act by somebody attacking you. It was it was uh, I, as I recall. It was an aid that to that you were given that did, didn't just didn't know what yeah. she he was doing. She didn't know what she was doing. I she was helping me transfer, and I subsequently uh, broke my femur. Right, that's right. Um, and I was out of commission for two months. Right, and the first two months of New Year's, I didn't even go to school because I was unable to sit. Right. My chair, right. Um. So I. Uh, so that is what I can now look back on and say, the luckiest thing that ever happened to me because it really forced me to. To change, course, and start valuing my education again because I mm -hmm. was really in a space where I didn't want anything to do with anyone. And mm -hmm. I was pretty depressed and yeah. almost suicidal. Really, at that point, having people who didn't automatically judge me because I was in a chair gave me the freedom to really be a teenager. Really just not feel like I was going to get constantly bullied for being just me. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and so then that kind of gave me the confidence to start really thinking about what I wanted to do with myself and mm -hmm. really wanted to pursue other things. And, and ultimately that's what led me to, to Berkeley. And, and did, when did, when did the idea come to you that you, you know, the, Education was your future, not in terms of learning, but in terms of actually teaching, being in a classroom, all of that stuff. Career. When when did that come? Um. Well, in Berkeley, I became very involved with the disability um, community, um, because Berkeley in the nineteen seventies was the birthplace of the disability rights movement. Yes. So through that, I started to really become proud of my disability and proud of of what of the struggles that had come before me and I really became immersed in this idea of the disability is not a detraction of who I who I, who I am but it's part of me and I'm, I should be proud of. So that was the moment where I, where I discovered, for lack of a better word, this idea of disability being, being such a, a focal point in my life. Um, and part of that was that my friends and I decided to teach a student run, uh, class once a week for, uh. For fellow students, uh, it's a program that Berkeley had at that moment, and I believe still has, um, called Democratic Education at Cal, um, and we uh, we develop curriculum for students to become um, personal care attendants for folks with disabilities, and so they. At the same time as they were helping uh, individuals with disabilities and 
being paid for it, but they were also coming to our class once a week and we were telling them about the history of the disability rights movement. We were inviting speakers and and the like, and that's when I really got bit by the teaching bug because mm -hmm. I started to realize like these classmates of mine had no idea of the rich history that Berkeley had in and of itself for the disability rights movement. And even though it was really great to see so many people with disabilities on Berkeley campus, and it was, it had always been kind of a mecca for students with disabilities, I think giving people the opportunity to understand why that was, was was something that I was really proud of. Can we just switch tracks for a second? That, that, yeah. Um, when you meet people for the first yeah. time, even back then and and now, well, you said it, right? I mean, your disability is in some ways, not not only from the choice of what you, what you have engaged in and the business you started, et cetera, and the work that you've done in the disability rights movement, but um, but you're sitting in a chair, and yeah. and so it's there, and is it is it a source of frustration? I mean, it, or is it? I mean, obviously, people react to it in different ways. Yeah. Right. Um, and I mean, could you talk about that? Is that is that does it tend to be hard? Does it? What what do you, do you feel like you have to? you have to do things to put people at ease or how does that, how does that work? It is a sense. I I don't know if I would call it frustration, but it, it when I see people's demeanor change, when I walk into a room, it's something that I, um, that I, unfortunately I had to deal with for so long that it kind of rolled on my back at this point mm -hmm. and I automatically have to like start uh giving people my resume for lack of a better word so that they start understanding that that they're not just talking to to anybody but that I'm that I have a right to be in the in the space mm. and have an opinion, mm. uh, and Interesting. that does get kind of tiring at times. <laughs> but I'm also, like I said, I'm also so used to it yeah. that that it's just kind of become second nature. Which well, you know, it's me. It's interest. What's interesting? What I remember vividly, when I recall vividly, <laughs> is. Um, <clears throat> right from the start, I felt comfortable having frank conversations with you. I remember in the interview, I remember <laughs> asking you, asking you the question, you know, you said, when, when you're speaking, you know, you're animated. You, like many people, yep. speak with our hands for expression. Yep. Our hands work differently. You and it yes. Is it your your the tone of your voice changes? Is this discomfort? Is it what what and and I mean I felt I think I was I think I grew up thinking, or maybe I was even taught that that was impolite. Right, or yeah. that that was yeah. not what you do. You don't have an honest conversation or a, a, a frank conversation. But I felt somehow so at ease. Maybe it was your parents, maybe it was just, I think it was you. And you responded just really clearly about that. And, and you had this incredible ability as a kid <laughs> to. You make it really clear. You can have any conversation you want with me. You may not. You may not get the answers you want, <laughs> but but you're not gonna. It's not gonna offend me that you ask me a question. And that was, you know, that was amazing. 
And at the same time, it felt like, geez, I wish I had been the adult in that room rather than you. <laughs> And, but honestly, that was one of the things that I most appreciated, because I remember being very frank in that in that interview, saying, "I don't even want to be at your school. Like, why am I here?" <laughs> but and then having the, the, that conversation that you recalled, and saying, "Like, I'm really happy that we're having this conversation because." So many people just don't ask those questions because, like you said, they don't feel like they're being polite. Um, and sometimes politeness doesn't get us anywhere. Like yeah. if you, yeah. if your if your concern that I'm getting tired because I'm my pitch is changing or something like that then you're not giving me the chance to to fully express. Um, and I've learned from that conversation that I have to put myself out there more. And I have to tell people, like, my speech might be a little different than everyone else's, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that that I'm tired. It doesn't it just means that my vocal cords function a little differently mm -hmm. uh, because of my spasticity. Uh, so I've learned in in the professional space that I do have to make people at ease with what they're about to see, mm -hmm. um, which mm -hmm. is interesting, but it's something that... I and some people might say, "Well, it's not your responsibility to do that." But if I don't do that, then I'm not going to be given the same opportunity. Right. Right. So if you don't, if you don't do that, and if they don't do that, right? I mean, there's a way in which, like, you should. I mean, I kind of agree with this thing. You shouldn't have to do that. On the other hand, you know. If you don't, if if they don't ask, if there's not an opportunity for you to tell, they're going to walk away with certain assumptions based in ignorance. Exactly. Exactly. And, and so all sorts of opportunities will be denied, right? I mean, or exactly. also, and, and, and that can't be good, right? I mean, <laughs> I mean I, you know, <laughs> I remember, I just got to, I just had this flash as you were speaking of your parents come coming to pick you up, uh, it wasn't the first day, but I think it was the second or third day. It was the end of the week. And where's Sophia? You know, her folks are here to pick her up. And there you were <laughs> with Lori Stevens sitting on your lap, yep. racing, racing down the walkway <laughs> in your electric wheelchair. And <laughs> just, you know, it's just like, oh, this is the right place for this kid. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. And then you gave no, me No, <laughs> Yeah. No, I, and I, and that was, that, those were some of the times where I realized, like, the, the fact that I was given the opportunity to be in such a, juxtaposition of a educational experience like from the really really toxic to the really really just open mm -hmm. I think has made me stay in education because I want to be part of an part of somebody's experience just like you were and the folks who were back at New Roads back in the day were for me where they where I wasn't some problem to deal with but I was just another I was just another 14 year old kid like yeah. it, it you was you were a 14 year old kid with a go-kart <laughs> I know exactly like I had some some good to bring to the community whether yes. it was like being a taxi cab for Lori Stevens or <laughs> or like a joke for someone else. Like like I think that was 
the moment where I was like, this is, this is just so not something that I'm used to because I was for so many years just this anomaly of a kid who was very smart, but nobody took seriously aside from my parents and my family right. because I was not what they were used to as a person in a chair. Right. A lot of folks don't have the time to spend hours on the internet um, and find those resources and find those people and the financial stuff is also an issue. The financial sure. resources to find the attorneys and find the things right. and um, so I I count my my blessings in that regard that I was able to get myself out of a toxic situation because who knows what my what my mm -hmm. life trajectory would be if I hadn't sure. done that switch. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, and then so, I mean, you know, I, it, I almost don't even know how to think about it. I was, you know, I was about to say, how could that not be, how could that not be frustrating? Right. I mean, and, and I get that it's not necessarily your experience, but, but, but the idea that somehow you just, you know, a person has to, a person has to fight to be even be seen, never mind yeah. be seen. And then, and then seen for what you are, <laughs> just and, to be. And I still have to fight to be seen, regardless of, I mean, I've done everything that I could possibly do to, in terms of education, to have seats at different tables. Um, but to this day, if I don't pull out the fact that I'm a doctor at certain events, people are just like, oh, she's she's just another educator. Like somebody must have given her. Well, I've gotten the, when I tell people that, that I am still a, a teacher at my old high school, they're like, oh, well, that's nice. Oh, that's nice. They gave yeah. you a job at your old high school. And, and so, I I I constantly am fighting against the oh you got the pity job right and well, and does that and come does that come so, that. sorry sorry does does that come also from uh from colleagues I don't mean people you work with at the school necessarily but like but other people with with physical or otherwise dis other disabilities or challenges do they do they assume that you got the pity job? No, no, no I, I wouldn't say it comes from people who are are in the in the disability community, but it comes from other able-bodied folks all the time. Yeah, yeah, got it. Um, because they assume that the only person or the only people that would give me a job uh, while I was still getting my master's uh, even though I was still getting, I was getting my master's in education and and all of that, uh, the only people that would give me a a teaching job to be in front of other children, yeah, um, would be the people that were yeah. high school teachers. I I I, I assume. I don't. I wish I didn't. I wish I wasn't going to say this. I assume that 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 a lot of people who a lot of people at the time felt that way right? when I hired you, when I offered you the job. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I assume. I mean, I remember having concrete conversations with you about that too, and I was like, "Look, I don't want to be your pet. Like, I don't want to be." here only because I'm an alumni of the school. Yeah. Like I want to be valued for what I bring as a teacher. Right. And and there's still days where it feels like sometimes parents, colleagues, anyone might think, 
oh, well, you're an alumni, how sweet. And I'm like, but I've also been here for for 17 freaking years. Like, <laughs> at some point, give me some credit. Like, give me some credit, yeah. Well, give everybody some credit. It's like nobody's keeping you around as because you're like a mobile, right? You know, yeah. oh, isn't this interesting? Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. right, right. Well, no, yeah, but although I mean, it, you know, I would say the risk that I felt in hiring you back then yeah. was just you know you were a young teacher and you know yeah, yeah. and and I know you would be walking in the room not just as an inexperienced or relatively an relatively inexperienced teacher but you have that other thing to overcome yeah and yeah. and you know as much as i thought well this is a pretty amazing community it's like this is it was risky and not you know i knew that you had the i mean guys i knew you i knew that you were extraordinary but but I didn't know that it would be extraordinary enough, and that you know, there's there's a lot of was well, as you know, right? I mean, there's a learning curve that only comes. Yeah. You can't learn it all without being in the classroom, and then you're in the classroom, and it's like whoo, right? And, and it, let's be honest, teaching on your roads is teaching a whole new. It's a whole other beast than teaching yes. at other schools. Oh yeah, for good reason. Yeah, but. But it also made me know what how I had to handle myself and the the professionalism with which I had to present from the very beginning. Yes. Not necessarily like how I looked, but but I had to have my teaching in order from the very beginning yes. because I knew that if not, parents were going to be like. What are you doing? Like, right. and they were automatically going to use the disability as a scapegoat, right. uh, regardless of whether it had anything to do with it or not. Sure, they were going to say, "Well, this person doesn't know how how to teach," and the reason is because she doesn't teach traditionally, and she doesn't write things on the board, right? And she doesn't do all this, but. And I remember having various conversations with various parents as in the very beginning, saying like, well, exactly, the speech conversation came into play, like, your speech is a little slurred. And I'm like, but can you understand what I'm saying in English? Because <laughs> if you can understand what I'm saying in English, I'm pretty sure your son can understand what I'm saying in Spanish. Um, so, so... But once once people got to know me and got to know how serious I was about teaching, those conversations started to not happen as much. Yes, exactly. Um and and that's that's the unfortunate thing. Like I feel like I'm never going to be able to get a chance just by applying to a position or or a conference blindly like somebody needs to know me before they actually give me a chance mm -hmm. so the reason i was given a chance by you was like you said you knew me and you were willing to give me a chance right that happens in every single aspect of my life Right. If somebody knows me and knows that I'm capable, they they understand that well she she's got her shit together. She's gonna be able to 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 do everything that we're asking her to do. But unfortunately, the sight unseen situation is never gonna work for me um, because the second they see me. They're going to make that assumption of, well, we didn't know that you were in a chair. Like, mm. how does that work? And so I automatically, I never once have not disclosed my disability because of that. Like, mm -hmm. Because if the person is going to make an assumption right off the bat because I'm sitting in a chair, I'd rather not deal. 
Are there are there are there specific assumptions that people make? Like, is there a, do they cluster? You know, what yes. are some of these assumptions that they make? No, the the main assumption is that I'm just not intelligent hmm. uh, because they associate the sitting in the chair with some sort of of mental delay. They assume that the person sitting in the chair also has some sort of developmental delay. Uh, they assume that the person in the chair drift because they can't drive doesn't have the ability to get places. So they're, uh, so um, there's all sorts of right. societal assumptions. Right. Right. And but then well, I'm always right. going to be dependent on other people, which, sure, I am to a certain extent, but it doesn't mean that I don't live my life independently. Yes, and nor does it, you know, what it if anybody pays attention to that for more than a nanosecond, you know, <laughs> oh, so that this person is dependent on other people. Really? <laughs> like, <laughs> you mean, you mean there are people who aren't? You mean you go out and farm your own food? What are you talking about? <laughs> like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> like, and and lest lest anybody think otherwise, <laughs> I, had, I had a lot of conversations uh, when I was when I was in the school. I had a lot of conversations with teachers about their grades being late. I never had to have that conversation with you, not once. <laughs> I was always like, oh my God. <laughs> but but there, but also there is that that. I always made sure, and I always, to this yeah. day, make sure that I conduct myself. This is, and you hear this conversation with so many different uh, groups of people who always feel like they have something else to prove. Um, so for me, it's because of my disability, maybe also because I'm Latina, and all, all sorts of things. But... There are people who will always say, like, I have to make sure that my stuff is spotless because if not, somebody is going to judge me. Right. I live with that every day. Like, I, I can't drop the ball on anything. Okay, so how is that not exhausting? It is. It's <laughs> exhausting. Um, but... It's become so much of what, of what I had to do mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that, um, that it, 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 it's not even, it's not even, um, something that I have to necessarily think about anymore. Sure. Because it, it just is. Yeah. But, but like, even, like, for the last few years, I've had to, like, take some time off for various medical procedures from work. Um, and even when I'm technically on medical leave, like, I'm, I'm constantly making sure that people understand that I'm not, like, taking a break. From being a professional, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. and that that goes back to my mental idea that if I don't prove to these people that I'm still that I'm still part of it and that I'm still looking out for my students, my my colleagues, whatever. Uh, then I can be gone in the blink of an eye and I don't want to be gone because yeah. if I'm gone, then it's going to be 10 times harder for me to find a job. Yeah. Yeah. That's because of everybody's assumptions. Yeah. Is there ever a way around that? Do you see it? Do you see it? I don't mean for you personally, but I mean, I guess that's the work of the disabled dis disability community, right? I mean, disabled rights, et cetera. Et cetera. Is yeah. that, how, how does that, how do you make a dent? I mean, you I do mean, make a dent in it, but 
with your competence, but but boy, is that an uphill climb. I mean, I see it every time I go into it because, like you said, I I've now started a company uh, with with a colleague. Um, so we go in and we have these conversations and, and imagine what what you can then start to do in building inclusive, like truly inclusive workplaces, and 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 all of that so bringing disability to that conversation is part of what's going to eventually solve this mm. idea of of why is it so difficult to be a professional with a disability mm -hmm. um because of a lot of these assumptions that people make i have a question for you that the folks broke your pelvis or pay broke your femur right i mean they, <laughs> like it it had a real impact a yeah. real and i may I, you know i use that word hesitantly it had it had a an obvious impact on your well-being yeah that was not based entirely in your feelings you had feelings about yeah. it for sure yeah. but and i think a lot of times there's pushback there's pushback on DEI stuff because because often it feels like the only thing that people are speaking about or is is their feelings. I feel. I mean, I hear this from academics. I hear it from yeah from people in the you know the work world. It's like, what you know, I'm running a company. I'm not. I'm not here for your for my employees' feelings, you know. So right. somebody like, okay, I made a mistake. Sorry, um, you know, I called you the wrong pronoun, or I, or I, uh, uh, or I said something that, out of my own ignorance, that is, that that you feel hurt by, and, and yet, the stuff that happens, has happened to you. It just, right. you know, it feels more oh. real. I don't know how to say this other than, I don't know how to say it in a way that that doesn't sound shitty, but it's like, it feels more real. But it is shitty. Um, but what, what I think what the, what the work is now is to say, if you, if you are a company that is stating to the world that you are, trying to be more inclusive then how are you going to exclude one one category for lack of a better word that is so cross it's it it crosses all different types of 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 minority Yes. I uh, think you can be a woman, you can be a, whatever it is. So what we are trying to say uh, is whether you think it's based on feelings or not, um, it's reality. And if you as a company are saying we are invested in the, in making it a more equitable work, if you are that person who doesn't give a damn and and just rather focus in on your company's bottom line, then don't say it in your mission statement that you want to be an equitable work. Well, but, so, but wait, so Lim, can I push back here for a second? Yeah. Um, but but. We'll include, this is somebody, I'm speaking for somebody else. We will include anybody who can help us get to our goal, which is making widgets. You know, we right. want to make certain kinds of widgets. We want quality control. But like, so, so whoever can do that. And if somebody is in a wheelchair who can do that, great. And if somebody is black who can do that, great. And if somebody is, but, but, <clears throat> but the fact that somebody is, the fact that somebody is in some identity group 
why should that why should why should I have to pay attention to that? Because I'm not in the business of that. I'm in the business of widget making. Right. Correct. But part of it is because it's the law. Like there has to be some version, some a uh, some realization from companies that there is some law that is driving the 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 placement of your workers in equitable condition. So part of that is that going beyond the going beyond the law, it's now become what 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 kind of image do you want to give to the outside world? And and since now it's become part of this idea of making your places where people actually want to come and work and want to be be seen, just like I was finally seen as a as a integral part of a community when I walked into New Roads. I think that's what workplaces are finally realizing. People are much more productive as employees when they feel seen and heard. And being seen and heard is part of the work of DEIAB. Is like, what does it mean to belong in a work in a workforce? What does it mean to have diversity and equity in a workplace? It means having the tough conversations that a lot of the, a lot of companies don't know how to go about because because of the same idea that we talked about in the in the first place is we've been we've been told and I put myself in this we've been told that sometimes these topics are taboo because they're really uncomfortable and but until we address them there's n nothing is going to come of it and that's how that's why uh myself and and my colleague come in and ha and facilitate some of the conversations around disability but to go back to your point i think i think the idea is really about if you are more seen and heard you become a more productive person i was given the opportunity to show who i really was at new world um, right, and but it was ultimately, it it was. Not, I mean, I'm not sure this is true. I'm just I'm 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 riffing here. It was ultimately your ability to teach students to work with students effectively that is most valuable in. In the school setting, right? I mean, I mean, you're right. You're doing all, right? So, but the so, school itself gave me the tools I needed to show that skill. Gave you the, the tools you needed. What does that mean? What do you mean by that? Like, gave me the opportunity oh. to sit, and 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 if I needed, if I needed someone to make copies for me, that person was there. So I was never denied that the opportunity to sit in the room and prove myself. What is happening is that, and what what why companies like mine exist is that oftentimes that opportunity is not even given because people are so scared of what that implies. If we hire someone with a disability, what does that imply? It means that we're going to have to spend thousands of dollars on equipment or, and 
sure, there might be circumstances where where that might happen, but there's also really simple things that you can do and just awareness based that you can do to make an environment more welcoming to someone with a disability. Mm-hmm. You did a lot of that without even knowing that that's what you were doing. Um, and that's the point that that I'm trying to make. It's, yes, I, I proved that I had the skills to be a good teacher. I proved that I had, but, but part of what made me a successful teacher is to feel like I was, I was valued and I was welcome to show those skills in that environment. Not everyone is going to be able to achieve master's degrees and, and doctorates and things like that. But, but there's, there's productivity at every single level that is being taken from people with disabilities because other folks, able-bodied folks, whatever you want to call them, are just not giving them the opportunity to yeah. to show. Let me ask you a couple of questions that I tend to ask almost everybody. Uh, who or what inspires you? And and what are you what are you most proud of? You who inspires me are the folks that I uh, that I've been fortunate enough to be in the fight with. Um, I now sit on several boards of disability organizations, um, and just being in the room with those folks and seeing that I am not uh, alone in mm-hmm. the fight for for equity, justice, whatever you want to call it. That's why I have now given some substantial attention t- to um, the 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 programs that I run as part of the as part of my company, uh, really giving employment preparation to folks with disabilities and mm. and and awareness trainings to different employers and and companies because I feel like that is what I can give them because they do respond to the fact that I am a well-educated person and and when they see my resume and all of that they are more likely to to hear me mm-hmm. because I am because I'm I've proven for lack of a better term myself as as a professional mm-hmm. um so when I'm in those spaces that is what I'm most proud of because hopefully by hearing from somebody mm-hmm. in my position they are they are slowly opening themselves up to the possibility that that things can be more inclusive in their workspaces or more more welcoming to other folks with disabilities and working with the folks with disabilities showing them that yeah you might not be a full-time educator but you are capable of adding perspective and adding your story to different workspaces mm-hmm. um and and giving them that kind of boost of it is possible yes it sucks sometimes to always have to be on and explain yourself and explain what your disability is and how it affects you and all of that mm-hmm. but if you do it and you are are a willing participant in those sometimes really draining conversations, you're gonna change it for 
another person down the road. Mm-hmm. And I hope to be able to continue to do that for as long as I can, uh, because there's still a lot of work to do. There's still a lot of work to do. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. Yeah. There's still a lot of work to do. And uh, you ever think about, you know, trying to get a different gig someplace? Or is 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 digging into your company really where you're where you're no digging uh, into digging into this kind of work is really where if I if I were to transition out of teaching for like teaching Spanish and all that, what I would want to transition to is full time company got it. work. Got it. Um um and like I said, I'm 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 keeping myself in that game by being as present as other in other aspects, board memberships and and the sure. like, just to be part of that community. Uh, I lost it for a little bit um, when I because I when I first started to teach, I I wanted to kind of prove to myself that I didn't have to focus in always entirely on the disability um aspect because i wanted to i wanted to first prove myself as the best spanish teacher as i possibly could and then i realized that i really was lacking that that passion that disability activism has always given me mm-hmm. ever since i was at berkeley and mm-hmm. so I s- started to really reach out to different organizations. And, and from that point, it's just been having those different facets of what drives me as a professional yeah. has really been a good idea um, for me personally, because it's given me different areas where I can influence whether whether the the person is sitting in my Spanish class or my teacher preparation class or or what have you, I hope that just being in front of me and seeing my journey has helped them realize that whatever they come to the table with is not something that they can they should be ashamed of or, or necessarily try to normalize mm-hmm. because it, it is what makes you you it is indeed. The last thing I, that I would say to anyone listening is just, just have co- have the difficult conversations when you're given that opportunity. Because the difficult conversations and what you might consider impolite conversations are the ones that are going to give you the greatest degree of understanding mm-hmm. of who that person really is. I remember <laughs> having conversations with you. And really understanding what your perspective was helped me understand what I needed to, mm. how I needed to present and what I needed to mm. to do to make more people mm-hmm. uh, understand where I was coming from. I think one of the things I, I am most frustrated about, about the, what feels like the, a growing part of the culture is the, There's so there's less and less permission in in the culture, at least my experience. There's less and less permission in the culture to have those difficult conversations with um, with space to fuck up, mm-hmm. right? I mean that that there seems like it seems more and more that mistakes mistakes are not something you're allowed to make and there's there's often it oftentimes feels like there's no way to come back from them people mm-hmm. are um it's not that they're just so willing so ready to be offended it's like uh it's like if somebody feels offended you've now done something that has all sorts of other implications so it's it's 
at a time when it feels like we need more and more of the difficult conversations, you mm -hmm. know, there's less and less tolerance for. I think one conversation at a time, you can realize you can change somebody's, or you can have a deeper conversation with certain people. And, totally. and those are the conversations that you're left with, but not, but being, but not wanting to bridge those conversations because you're scared of the outcome right. is the worst thing you can do. Totally. Well, Sophia, I am glad you were willing to have those conversations with me both back back twenty something years ago. Is that true? And, yep. and now, and um, so thank you, thank you so much. You're welcome. It and would you do me a favor? Would you say hello to your mom and dad for me? I will, absolutely.